Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel, for that um, quite intense introduction, actually, it's, uh, <laughs> in a good way. Um, so yeah, so thanks to Rachel Holmes and to Elaine Sheehan and all, to all the organizing committee for making it possible for me to be here. I'm genuinely excited about it. Um, so just to give a, a short account of what it is I think I'm going to do for the next 30, 35 minutes. Um, so this is a version of a paper that is currently under review at a journal called the History of the Human Sciences, which is a kind of interdisciplinary social theory and kind of history of sociology and anthropology journal. Um, at best, it's going to come back with major revisions. So I'm genuinely, um, you could, you'd be doing me a favor by telling me where I'm going wrong. So I, there will be a chance for me to redo it. So I'd be very grateful, genuinely grateful, if you could help me with that. Um, one or two other things to say before I launch into it. Um, this is quite a kind of a formal social theory paper, and it's going to be a red paper. And I'm increasingly unapologetic about that, but some people get upset about it, so I'm just going to flag it at the start. And I don't know if I'm going to do, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do the work that I've been asked to do, which is kind of putting theory to work. I'm, anyway, it's a, it's a phrase that I'd, I'd be interested in talking about more. What I'm going to try and do, and what I try and do across all my work, is to make theory and method into problems for one another. Um, and hopefully that will become apparent in the way that I talk about these things, even though I'm not explicitly talking about an empirical project. And the last kind of apologetic thing to say is that, so I'm a sociologist for, for good or ill, mostly for ill. Um, and this paper is, takes place on the terrain of British sociology. And as you'll see, a lot of the paper is kind of a close reading of one very sociological, capital S, text. And that might be tedious for people who are not sociologists, but what I hope will be obvious or will become obvious is how the way I want to read that paper and talk about it should translate into a whole series of other domains in which qualitative methods are at stake. So stay with me even if you're not a sociologist, especially if you're not a sociologist. Okay. <coughs> so in 2007, Mike Savage and Roger Burroughs published a paper that would go on to become one of the landmark British, sociolog British sociology papers of the decade. Their paper was called The Coming Crisis of Empirical Sociology and was published in the journal Sociology, which is the foremost publication of the British Sociological Association. At its heart, this paper is an attempt to identify and get some purchase on what they take to be a transformational moment in the collection and analysis of sociological data, as that data was becoming more and more tangled up in digital technologies and the private institutions that control those technologies. So the paper asked, what happens to the methodological jurisdiction of sociology in an age when massive commercial agencies of the digital and algorithmic economies, they mean Facebook essentially, can gather infinitely more social data in an infinitesimally smaller amount of time than even the most dedicated and well-equipped team of social scientists. So in the paper, they describe this incident in 2005 when Mike Savage, who I think was then professor of sociology at York, he's now professor of sociology at the LSE, when he went to a methods festival to present on a social network analysis that mapped the ties and affiliations of a group of people working in voluntary organizations. So after his talk, Savage tells this story in the paper. You can think about the performance of story here. Savage tells this story about how he bumped into a man who was also interested in social network analysis, but who was not an academic, let alone a sociologist. In fact, it turned out this man worked for the research arm of a large telecommunications company. And as Mike Savage talked to him, it became apparent that in putting together his own social network, this man had access to the records of every phone call ever made by everyone connected to his company's network. So compared to Savage's own study of 320 people, which for a sociologist is enormous, <laughs> <laughs> it's disturbing that that gets a laugh. <laughs> uh, compared to Savage's own study of 320 people, this man and the large private organization he worked for were sitting on a data pile of literally billions of social ties. What I want to think about in this paper is how are we to think about the future of qualitative methods in the face of such challenges? But my object, quite unlike Savage and Burroughs, is not to join in lamentation. In fact, what I want to do in this paper is take the genre of methodological lamentation itself as an object of inquiry. And I want to do that with two goals in mind. First, and this is going to be broadly implicit in what, in what follows, I think, I'm going to set myself against what I want to call, following the queer theorist Lee Edelman, a kind of reproductive futurism of British sociology. And what I mean by that is a concern evident within sociology, a deeply conventional and conventionalizing anxiety, I think, or a desire for sociologists to reproduce themselves and their institutions and their ideas and their disciplines into some nameless future in the face of what they see as met methodological encroachment and crisis. The second thing I want to do, and this is going to be explicitly what I talk about, I want to draw out another figure that I think is haunting these discussions, 
which has not yet been made explicit, and which I think nonetheless is going to offer some less conventional ways of imagining the future of sociological method, and this is the figure of life. In what follows, I'm going to argue that a sense of life, its precarity, its contingency, its ebbing away, sits at the center of these methodological anxieties. So the question I'm asking in this paper is, what would happen if we reread reflections on methodological crisis as ways of thinking about sociology's relationship to living things? What if we re-diagnosed what is, for Mike Savage, an ongoing question in the politics of method as, in fact, a slanted intervention in the politics of life? So 20 years ago, Thomas Osborne and Nicholas Rose offered a set of theses about the forms of voice in which social thought had moved through the 19th and early 20th centuries. They asked, how should we then make sense of the articulations of social thought in our own era when society is no longer social, or at least is not social in quite the same way? So Osborne and Rose's proposal is that what we should do is attend to the work of what they call social technicians. People attending to social technicians who work on the kind of, a kind of ethical and practical inventiveness of social research. So they say, and I quote, one learns more about the conditions under which we've come to, be, come to be able to understand our experience as social by attending to what they call an applied ethics of intervention and investigation than by reconstructing a canon of social theory. So in this paper, what I'm trying to do is to pick up the thread of precisely that suggestion. I'm trying to ask what a new ethics of investigation for qualitative research in this mode might look like and how it might help us to maybe move beyond the reproductive futures of both crisis and canon. So let me return to the paper by Savage and Burroughs that I began with, that I really, for the next 10 minutes, want to do quite a close reading of. So in one reading, the core contribution of this paper is that it turns on an argument about the epistemic designs of commercial institutions under late capitalism. It's a concern with what they call, after Nigel Thrift, knowing capitalism. So what does it mean, they ask, when the privately owned digital fallout of everyday interaction turns out to be our primary means for thinking the everyday? This is, I think, actually an interesting question, but Savage and Burroughs don't really go into it. In fact, their overall concern is not at all on capital, but on method, and maybe more specifically, on the provenance of method. So Savage and Burroughs are fundamentally attentive in their paper to questions of methodological jurisdiction, including the very active politics of boundary policing through which jurisdiction gets made. And as they point out, for all its theoretical desires, British sociology has actually survived the 20th century largely by virtue of its methods. It's the research technologies of sociology, the questionnaire, the interview, the case study, the community study, that has garnered whatever limited prestige sociology still has. So hence the concern. Massive social data gathering technologies and the private interests that own them, which are simultaneously engines of digital capitalism, enablers of social interaction, and repositories of, in fact, high quality data on that interaction, have no interest at all in either the data resources or the databases or the skills of university-based social scientists. And if this analysis holds fairly obviously for quantitative sociology, it is no less a problem, in fact, more of a problem for qualitative methods in their account precisely because of how these same private enterprises have recast social life. Old-fashioned research tactics like interviewing, life histories, ethnography, just to say the basic methodological ground of most British social science, seems full, fundamentally ill-equipped Ill to grasp what they call the, quote, myriad mobilities, switches, transformations, and fluidities in which contemporary social life take place. Interviewing is all well and good for what they call mid-range typifications of social action, but as a tool for generating sophisticated accounts of the diverse Weltanschauung that pertains in contemporary societies, I'm quoting, that's not my word, they are not so sure. So how should we read this paper now, an interesting 10 years after its first publication? So conveniently, in 2014, Savage and Burroughs themselves published a follow-up piece in a new journal called Big Data and Society. As they point out in 2014, what is perhaps most remarkable, remarkable about their original paper, looking back, is how commonplace its arguments have since become. What was once, they say, innovative and important has become, quote, a pretty mainstream position, not just in sociology, but also across the cognate social sciences more generally. <laughs> 
Another way to read the paper, though, in retrospect, and the way that I think I favor, is to say that a great deal of what is at stake in it is a certain kind of jostling for methodological, conceptual, and institutional ground among a particular generation of British sociologists. So one way to read this 2007 paper, including the figures it critiques in passing, the scale of its reception and influence, its author's attempt to read it in retrospect, the methodological innovations that came after it, the often strikingly sharp debate around those innovations, one way to read this is a fairly familiar and anxious labor of legacy leaving and career making, as well as the larger work of discipline shaping that is a necessary condition of that labor. And this, of course, all taking place among a group of senior sociologists, mostly if not exclusively men, either then inhabiting or coming to inhabit professorial chairs at one or more of the self-consciously elite soci sociology departments in the UK, insofar as such a thing exists. <coughs> This is the sense in which I want to say that reproduction sits at the center of this scene. As Mike Savage himself points out elsewhere, and I should say Mike Savage is a very sophisticated thinker on the history of discipline shaping, so he's not naive to this, I think. As Mike Savage himself points out elsewhere, the history of a discipline like sociology needs to be understood in a, quote, messy, competitive context, whereby the roles of different kinds of intellectuals, technical experts, and social groups are at stake. It might then, I would say, be important from, from a perspective like that to read the interventions around the coming crisis paper, not only as analysis of the counting work done by sociologists, quantitative or otherwise, but as claims about the kind of sociology that is going to count. But what is most striking to me, I think, about Savage and Burroughs' retrospective rereading of their own paper is that they root its legacy in the second half of its central compound, which is empirical sociology. Whereas the object that I find more prescient and insistent more, more urgent and attention-seeking is the first half of that title, the sense of crisis. In fact, I want to argue that it is this feeling of crisis and not a, not a debate about the collection of data that forms the paper's ground and that accounts for its influence. The word crisis itself in this reading is not incidental. Of course, it marks in the wake of Alvin, Alvin Guldner's famous work from 1971 a long-sustained trope in sociological lamentations about the state of sociology itself. But the specific term crisis, of course, also recalls histories of pathology and disease. The crisis, as any reader of late 19th century fiction like me knows well, so the crisis is the moment where someone goes out in the rain, gets inexplicably ill, and then there's a moment at which they may or may not die from rain. Um, that, that, that's the moment of crisis. So that formally, in, in the history of medicine, that, that's, that's where we get the word crisis from. So in, in, in the words of, of the sociologist Robert Holton, a crisis marks, quote, a particular stage in the development of an illness which is decisive for the future. The resolution of the crisis will determine whether the patient will recover or die. So recover or die. Does it overread these texts, I want to ask, to say that the very life of sociology is what is at stake? I don't think it is, and I'm going to give some examples. So noting that the discipline is far from the critical vortex that it was in the 1960s, Burroughs and Savage suggest that there is scope to rethink the assumption that, quote, the discipline of sociology was bound to exist. They describe indeed, and I quote again, a major nail in the coffin of academic sociological claims to jurisdiction over knowledge of the social. And what is needed in the face of such existential threat is a campaign to, again I quote, reinvigorate a sociological imagination for the 21st century. Whatever the quality of our article may have been, they say to one critical respondent, we certainly seem to have touched a nerve. I want to argue that such imagery, vital, biological, nervous, reveals some important stakes of this discussion. That an intense collective anxiety about the life of sociological methods, about the prospect of the discipline as both a lively and a lifely endeavor, lurks below the surface of these methodological lamentations and the anxious disciplinary atmosphere in which they were gratefully, perhaps too gratefully, received. <coughs> that same imagery reappeared a couple of years later in a sort of quasi-response to the empirical crisis paper published by Les Back in a monographic edition of the much hipper journal, The Sociological Review. There's a whole kind of undercurrent of disciplinary fashion to this debate that I'm kind of leaving unspoken. So there's LSE versus Goldsmith, sociology versus the sociological review. It's very um, 
for people who care, who, people who are sad enough to care about these things is a kind of a, <laughs> an, an undercurrent of fashion here. So in his paper, Sav Les Back agrees with Savage and Burroughs that we do indeed need to torque qualitative methods in order to seek new forms of encounter with nonlinear, emergent, processual, digital, and mobile forms of social life. But the solution, he says, is not to play around with the edges of method. Instead, Les Back argues, and I quote, there are some aspects of sociological practice that we need to bury. Indeed, not only a burial, but first, and again I quote, an autopsy on dead sociology is called for. So what follows in Les Back's actually super interesting paper is a sort of combined reanimation and post-mortem in which he root at, roots out what he calls, and again these are all quotes, fossil facts, lifeless conceptions, zombie concepts. Dead sociology, says Back, again this is a quote, is objectifying, comfortable, disengaged, and parochial. And what we need instead is a vital sociological future. New modes of attention, he argues, are necessary for, for producing what he calls vital texts, which will help us not only to bring sociology to life, but actually help sociologists, as what he calls organic intellectuals, both to live and even to sustain the life of things. So fossils, zombies, autopsies, burials, organic intellectuals, vital texts, lively things, an impetus for assassination, a desire to live. What can we say about the stakes of such a vocabulary? So two questions strike me at least. One is, how is it that the most pressing problem in qualitative methodology in a moment of transformation and crisis turns out to be at the same time a question of life? And two, why is it that this image of life seems so peculiarly lifeless? Because it is striking to me that a live sociology is not a sociology of flesh and blood. It involves organic intellectuals, but no organic materials. It draws on sensory methods, but no biological ones. There are well-laid plans for autopsies and burials, but none for measuring vital signs. As Elizabeth Wilson has argued, we've learned to be astute about the body in social and cultural theory, but we remain somewhat willfully ignorant about anatomy. So when I call attention to a certain lifelessness in this text, I don't mean that as an aesthetic judgment, but only to say that in this paper, life seems to be taken as determinate, as binary, as an object of adjudication. So this is an analysis in which sociology must be dead or alive, that it has a future or it doesn't, that existence is sustained or quenched, that concepts are vital or fossilized, that the future is digital or analog, that knowing capitalism will put us all out of work or make us all rich, and that we are all in the fil final analysis, silicon or carbon, possible or impossible, buried or resurrected, incorporated or zombified. So this is what I think the image of life is doing here. It's adjudicating the future with reference to the conventional binaries and taxonomies of the recent past. And yet, as the anthropologist Stefan Helmreich reminds us, the theoretical object at the heart of this adjudication, which is to say life, has lately become unmoored. This is not to say that the concept has dissolved into nothingness, but that at the limits of life sciences, what Helmreich calls limit biologies, researchers are pushing at the physical, temporal, and conceptual edges of what it actually might mean to be alive. So by limit biologies, Helmreich means specific kind of edge practices like astrobiology or deep ocean microbiology. So Helmreich's empirical interests are in people looking for signs of life in space on, on different planets or at the very bottom of the ocean where we're not sure if there's any conditions that can sustain life. He also does work on artificial life and kind of um, uh, and forms of digital life as well. All of which he takes to be what he calls limit biologies, which is spaces in which it's not clear whether or not something can actually be alive in that situation. And if it is, it reconfigures our, our idea of what actually life might be. So these are practices, according to Helmreich, that have at, the heart, have at their heart questions of what biologists think is possible for sustaining vi vitality and of what such sustenance might even mean in the first place. At such limits, says Helmreich, life, I quote, moves out of the domain of the given into the contingent, into quotation marks, appearing not as a thing in itself, but as something in the making in discourse and practice. So in the remainder of this paper, what I want to do is to think with Helmreich's notion of a limit biology and to ask what such a notion might do for us in terms of qualitative methodology and in the social sciences more generally. <laughs> 
to once again paraphrase Elizabeth Wilson, I want to ask if, it, if it's not possible to think the social through and with biological agencies, but to do so while expanding rather than contracting the present moment of transformation. What might it mean to think the material present of qualitative methods as a question of life, but to do so in the absence of a convention that takes biological data to be so determinedly binary, that takes biological concepts to be so ontologically inert? So the paper now takes a sharp and to the untrained eye somewhat random turn. But to the eye that has brains, this all makes sense. OK, let me now take a sharp turn. Um, in March last year, March 2016, in its Rockefeller-sponsored cities section, The Guardian reported on a, num on a survey on the number of panic attacks experienced by people in different urban areas in the UK. So what initially caught my attention is that the report identified the cities of South Wales, where I live, as the most stressed in the country. So in a table compiling the percentage of residents in a range of cities who reported a panic attack at least once a week, Swansea and Cardiff occupy numbers one and three respectively. So according to the survey in Cardiff, where I live, about 7% of residents, residents experience a panic attack every week. In Swansea, the figure is over 8%. There are obviously many ways in which we might want to think about the landscape of panic, panic attack, and panic disorder here. But what catches my attention is how the journalist who wrote this piece up wove a relationship between city living and stress around this finding. It's no surprise, she writes, and I quote her, that urban environments can contribute to the onset of panic disorder. Noise, jostling, crowds, treacherous and painfully slow-moving traffic, lack of green open space, filthy pollution, high crime rates and living costs, and social anonymity are just some of the factors that city dwellers say make them uneasy. The article goes on to describe how, in the, in the, in the author's terms, how an urban citizen's brain mediates these relationships. So activity in the amygdala is associated apparently with city stress. An increase in the acidity, le acidity level in synapses around the amygdala associates with increased ac this, incre this increased activity and elevated levels of carbon dioxide in the air associate um, increase the acid in the synapses that produce the stress. So a chain of associations begins to emerge. Stress and jostling in the urban landscape, competition, traffic, bad air quality, carbon dioxide, brain acidity, increased amygdala activity, panic. But here is the most interesting thing. As I read on, it became apparent that this survey was not carried out by a university research team, but by the manufacturers of a new device aimed at reducing urban stress called the BCAM. <laughs> I assume it's pronounced BCAM. It could be BCAM or the B could be silent, but it makes sense to me. <laughs> I have no reason to believe it's BCAM, but that makes sense. So the BCAM is a small inhaler-like object, a kind of resp respiratory intervention which works by giving the urban dweller a space to expel her stress-causing CO2-laden breath and to inhale in exchange air that has been filtered by the device to have the CO2 level of, quote, forest air. <laughs> it's, it's not me. So bad air of the city goes out, clean, pure forest air comes in. I don't know why people are laughing. Let me quote at length from the manufacturer's website. In effect, your air supply has been scrubbed of high CO2. This means your CO2 receptor now sends a message to your brain saying, relax, it's OK. It feels as though you just stepped out into a forest, but you haven't needed to go outside. <laughs> you can now get on with enjoying your day without worrying about having another episode. After all, you didn't have an episode. Be calm, stop your panic developing further. There's a lot of interesting philosophical claims in that that I don't really want to get into. The question that interests me is rather, how should we think, how should we think seriously about the affective and physiological weight of urban life, including our capacity to get a hold of that weight methodologically in a world where a device like this makes a certain kind of neuropolitical and technosomatic sense? So at stake here is a well-worn ethnographic object, which for the sake of convenience, I'm going to call urban stress and which is one node in the long-standing idea that there's an epidemiologically significant relationship between urban living and anxious or otherwise psychologically disordered states. So for the last few years, my collaborators and I 
have been trying to show how urban stress has come to matter across a range of scientific and historical practices. Much of our focus has been on the interest in urban ecology in sociology, which we trace kind of from late 19th century sociology through the Chicago School of Sociology and into contemporary epidemiological work. So in this literature, the city emerges as a space in which it seems somehow hard to disentangle the interior from the exterior or the citizen from the environment in which she finds herself. Obviously, we've been working to describe this landscape because of its intrinsic importance, but we've also been drawn to thinking about it as a space in maybe a less gestural way, to let us think in a less gestural way about methodological practices of the social sciences themselves, and also about the relationship of those practices to the technological and biological mutations in which they now find themselves. It's worth recalling at this point that the urban has long been a testing ground for sociological theory and method. Perspectives as unlike as human ecology, Marxist and critical thought, post-structuralist theory, and what we might call broadly non-representational approaches, all at least partly take root in urban studies. The city has especially been a fertile testing ground for a diverse range of scholars trying to figure out how the social and biological might get into one another. So we might construct a spectrum with, on one end, a figure like Patrick Geddes, who's a kind of late 19th, early 20th century kind of oddball on the margins of British sociology, involved in the Garden City movement, and very concerned with um, uh, what he called the notation of life in cities. Construct a spectrum with a figure like Geddes on one end, and on the other end, you know, fairly mainstream contemporary epidemiology, where in fact scholars still draw on the work of figures like Lewis Wirth, Robert Farris, Warren Dunham, in order to establish connections between city life, well-being, and happiness. So it's a source of ongoing interest to me that the Chicago School of Urban Sociology is almost entirely absent from contemporary sociology, is very present in epidemiology, which is, I think, worth thinking about. So as Orit Halperin and her colleagues remind us, and Liz de Freitas is here, the person who put me onto this paper. I don't know if she she is. Yes, <laughs> thanks for that. So as Orit Halperin and her colleagues remind us, there is nothing new in what she calls testbed urbanism, a logic of practice in which the city becomes, quote, a development environment for testing the, the operability of new technologies, processes, or theories for large systems. So I think it is precisely this strange test-bedded nexus of social theory, qualitative methodology, and biosocial relationality, as well as experiment, that draws me to think the empirical and methodological crisis of the social sciences through urban studies in particular. It also moves me to think the BCAM not simply as a mere effect of knowing capitalism and its designs and some mediated fantasy of stress-free urban existence, but as a very specific assemblage of materials, spaces, affects, bodies, interests, and capitals. One that stages and switches between a politics of urban space, a sensation of panic, a measure of CO2, a dream of a forest, a moment of breath, a panic in Swansea, an acid in a synapse. Is it not the case that just as with the astrobiologists described by Stefan Helmreich, we are not simply reaching the end of that well-worn theoretical object, the social, nor are we only stood gawping at its contingency. Rather, we're beginning to get some sense of the methodological practices that might push at the edges of its current limits. Objects and practices that might help us to stretch this notion, to extend it, to seek new agencies and new assemblages on the other side of it. Methodological practices that may even no longer go on under the sign of sociology or qualitative research or any similar descriptor. I think what I'm trying to account for here is the emergence of a limit sociology, which is to say the need for a set of methodological procedures that will actively expand the ontological terrain of what it might mean to be social in the first place. And with that in mind, could we also not then tentatively conclude that limit sociologies and limit biologies do not run parallel to one another, that they are in fact kin of a sort, that the most obviously proliferating agencies one quickly encounters beyond the bounds of what I'm calling reproductive futurist sociology and its methodological anxiety are precisely those imploded entities already well described by Donna Haraway, which are as much a symbol of, and I quote, particular sorts of historically situated machines as they are of historically situated organisms. What might an empirical crisis for sociology even begin to mean in such a situation? <laughs>
Let me conclude with one final reflection. So for the last couple of years, my collaborators and I, working with a set of colleagues at Fudan University in Shanghai, have spent some time in the migrant-oriented new towns around the edges of that city, key sites in the ongoing technological and industrial momentum of contemporary China. So our project is a collaboration between a set of researchers based in Chinese and UK universities, collectively trying to get some purchase on the mundane hassles of everyday migrant life in Shanghai by drawing together a complex range of ethnographic, epidemiological, and digital methods, and then triangulating these into some thicker account of what that life might be like. Obviously, the precise relationships are complex and multifaceted. But the status of being a migrant with its attendant stresses and anxieties and dislocations has long been associated in the epidemiological literature with poor mental health. What is, it, what is at stake in a city like Shanghai then, still in the midst of an enormous urban to rural, mig rural to urban migration, is a complex and still not well understood assemblage of urbanization, migration and stress, which is taking place precisely at the, sa at the same time as a boom in psychological interest and even in forms of psychological governance in China. So without wishing to pathologize or reduce this very varied and complicated experience, our team has been trying to think collectively about the politics of stress in migrant areas of Shanghai, and especially to think the biological, social, and sensory sequelae of that stress, which is to say the sequelae of competition and alienation, of uprooting and physical distance, of long hours and variable housing, of sometimes patchy and bureaucratic access to services, and so on. This is obviously much too short of a, an account of a complex endeavor. But I gesture at it here because I want to say that if I had originally understood this project as a more or less novel attempt to simply connect the social and biological in an interesting and creative way, increasingly I've started to think of what we're doing as a kind of limit sociology, which is to say as an attempt to gently but seriously push on our sense of what a social life is, on where it might be sought, on what kind of action and practice might be organized under its sign, and on what kind of methods might actually be brought to bear on it, and how we want to describe those methods. I'm not claiming that our project, which I've barely described here, and which is still quite new, I'm not claiming that that project has invented anything new, or that it is profoundly novel. It is neither, for what it's worth. I am arguing that it's empirical assumptions, and that it is far from alone in this, that it's empirical assumptions arrange social life and as, as an assemblage that is as amenable to digitally mediated psychological self-ratings as it is to ethnographic field notes, as it is to boring old epi epidemiological surveys, as it is to measures of cortisol taken from someone spitting in a cup. And that at least in the sense of what I call reproductive futurist sociology, this places our project at the limit and perhaps beyond the limit of what counts as normal science. We're thus in search of some more ambitious procedure for confronting the epistemological and methodological conundrum with which I started, which is a procedure for somehow thinking the material transformations of the present, not as a cause for alarm, not at the sign of crisis, not the absence of the future, nor still a premonition of death, but rather as a vector for thinking in less conventional ways about just these kinds of binaries, maybe even as a reason to let go of this collective sense of doom, to finally dial down the panic to breathe in the forest air and even to be calm. Thanks. <laughs>